All right, we're going to get started. Um, how many of you, with a show of hands, have ever attended a live recording of a .NET Rocks show? Oh, well, that's cool. Several. Uh, for the rest of you, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to scream at the top of my lungs, and he's going to turn the record volume down. Hey, Porto, it's .NET Rocks! And I want you to scream as loud as you can, clap, bang your feet, pick up your chair, beat the person next to you, take off your clothes, <laughs> and we'll set fire to the building, all right? Are you with me? Yeah! Are you with me? Yeah! Have fun! All right. Yeah. Holy crap. <laughs> this is a great room. For, it's a great for a lot of echo. Yeah. <laughs> so a great room. Certainly filled the space. Quality up. is determined by level of volume. Yeah. Absolutely. The blast radius. There, there you go. Right? Hey, so we're back in Portugal. We are back in Portugal. It's great to be I here. love I love Porto. I love Portugal. I was um in the middle of town and I came across a restaurant and the sign said Churrascaria which means grill, right? De Infante. I didn't know you guys ate babies over here, so. No? No. No, it's not funny? Maybe you translated it wrong. Too long, too long, uh, too soon? Yeah, that's all. Do Infante. I guess Infante is the name Twins. of the area. Yeah. Two babies. But it looked like we eat our babies. Well done. Nice. On a skewer. I think it was W.C. Fields said it was all about the sauce. Yeah, uh, yes. I love children. <laughs> yeah. A little yeah. bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. Yeah. Got it. Exactly. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to have some fun today. We are going to have some fun. But first, we have this little thing called Better Know Framework. Roll that crazy music. Uh, well, somebody can hear it in their head because you can't hear it in the room. <laughs> but I see you dancing with it. Yeah, it is crazy music, isn't it? It's too? great music. But we never hear it when we actually record, so you're yeah. you're getting to see the sausage being made. Yeah, if you ever see us, you know, hear us talk about that music, it's a lie. It's a lie. <laughs> it's all added in post. We're an edited show. We have a great editor. His name is Brandon. Everybody say hi to Brandon. Hi, Brandon. Brandon, you're awesome. And yep. uh, he makes us sound smart. So now you're going to see us not sound so smart. <laughs> uh, all right, I guess it's my turn. Cue me in. All right, buddy, what do you got? Well, I've been waiting for this one because it happened a while ago, but uh, if you don't know, I have a consultancy called AppVNext, and we are the shepherds of a, an open source project called Poly. Anybody use Poly? How, oh, about, wow. uh, how about a clap of hands? Use Poly. Lots of hands. Well, Reverend Billy just walked in the room. Um, well, uh, Poly just, did a ma just came out with a major update version eight, and it, believe it or not, it started with the .NET team. Because the .NET team was basically looking at the source code and said, hey, we think we can improve the performance and the resource usage of Poly, but it's gonna require some new interfaces and you know, a, a, almost a complete rewrite. Hmm. And so the rest of us said, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. sorry, did the .NET team call you? Yeah. <laughs> said they wanna make your project Better. Yeah, I mean, what do you say? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> so it took a lot of meetings and a lot of uh, uh, understanding. And basically what they were able to do is without you having to change any of your code that uses poly, you will get the benefits of the new performance and resource allocation uh, that's under the hood. But if you want to use the new models and the paradigms, and the in, uh, interfaces, you're, you can do that. Oh, so Greenfield, you can go forward. With a new style. With a new style. But just if you use Poly in place, uh, I'm not sure if it's completely compatible or you have to change some class to some other class, but it's pretty much a, a simple cool. a simple fix. And I have been emailing with Joel Hewlett to schedule yeah. a Poly show for Don Iraq. Yes, we definitely so want to So we'll get that figured that. out. That's cool, man. So that's what, that's what I got. Awesome. 
Who's talking to us, Richard? Grab your comment off of show 1860, the one we did with Jeremy Miller back in the summer of 23. Talk about minimal architecture because Jeremy likes to cause trouble, goodness knows. And this comment comes from Trevor, who says, I love this discussion. Enjoy the comments on microsurfaces versus monoliths, which is actually a reference to an earlier show we did with yeah. Leila Porter. We've been following this trend of people you know, sort of pushing, um, back, on pushing back on microservices. Yeah. I got pushed heavily into microservices approaches with a product that we'd built and re-architected into microservices, and it was the worst mistake ever. <laughs> uh, things just became more complex. It was harder to maintain. It added a bunch of latency and security issues. The complexity was just not worth it. And so I came up with a new acronym for appropriately sized service. Or <laughs> ass. Nice. <laughs> I can relate. This is a good one. I 100% believe in services, separation of concerns, and clean architectures. But the approach must be appropriate to the complexity of the solution and the size of the team. Yeah. It makes no sense to have 100 separate services for a team of 10 people, but then it also makes no sense to have a massive single deployment with a code base and a team of 250 people. The services need to work with the cognitive load and be appropriate to the organization and team structures. And I was loving the discussion on all of this, except for that one point. Stop making the CTO out to be the bad guy. <laughs> Love from Trevor, CTO. <laughs> that's great. Yep, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, we, I definitely think we need a whole show on ass. I think so. Yeah, it seems so. Yeah. So, Trevor, thank you so much for your comment and a copy of Music to Code by is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code by, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or on the Facebooks. We publish every show there. And if you comment there and I read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code by. It's amazing. Wow. Dude. He actually does that every time. Did you think it was a recording? It's not pre recorded. It's not a recording. No. Never. Uh, so, that, that was an edit point. Okay. And you can also follow us on Twitter if you want to, but uh, the real cool kids are over on Mastodon. I'm at Carl Franklin at techhub.social. And I'm Rich Campbell at mastodon.social. Send us a toot. We'll get around to reading it. <laughs> read them yeah. all. We read them all. Publish shows. And with that, let us introduce Charity Majors to the show. Charity is an ops engineer and CTO at honeycomb.io. Before that, she worked at Parse. Facebook, and Linden Lab on operations and developer tools and always seem to wind up running the databases. That's because that's where all the problems were. Yeah, <laughs> you stand next to the database, you're yeah. going to be running it's it. It's contagious. Yeah, it uh, catches. Also co-author of O'Reilly's Database Reliability Engineering and the newly released Observability Engineering. Charity loves free speech, free software, and single malt scotch. And nice. You can blame her. Give her a hand. Round of applause. Charity Majors. Okay, well, I guess we got to start at the beginning, right? Start at the beginning. What the heck is observability? Observability. Observability. Observability engineering. Sir, that's a great question. Is that like the engineering of Windows? Yeah, kind <laughs> of. <laughs> uh, I mean, observability comes from control theory, right? right? And it's like, um, how well can you understand what's going on in, inside your systems just by observing the right. outputs? And um, Press the button, the light turns on. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I, for years, was, like, really religious about trying to define it in a very specific way, and I should have won, but I lost. Mm. So You were outnumbered. I was outnumbered. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I mean, it's come, to, it's come to just kind of be a generic synonym for yeah. telemetry, which is what it is. Um, but when we were trying to figure out how to talk about what I think of as just kind of the next generation of telemetry, it's kind of distinguished from the last generation of telemetry, obviously, okay. which was very much focused around the metric, right? Mm -hmm. Which is just a number yeah. with some tags appended, doesn't handle high cardinality, doesn't handle dimensionality, doesn't handle, it's super fast, yeah, super now you're, powerful. You're, now you drop some OLAP terms into there, cardinality, <laughs> visibility, like. It's funny for a database person to drop OLAP things. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you're, you're talking about just any way that you can really observe the state, the internal yeah. state, mm -hmm. not necessarily what it's doing on it's the about, outside. It's about observing the internal state and being able to explore it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Not having to decide in advance, here's the data I'm going to collect, because here's the questions I'm going to need to answer, here's my dashboard. Yeah. You know, it's about being able to go, 
to combine your questions, to, to ask, because like any, anything that you're trying to understand these days is going to be a very complicated answer for sure. the most part. It's like, okay, these errors are spiking, but only for users that are running this version of Android with this particular firmware right. in this region, with this language pack, with each of those is a high cardinality dimension. And mm -hmm. if you don't capture the data in a way that preserves all that context, you can't ask new questions. Do you have some examples of how um, observ observability has uh, improved a, a project in particular? Uh, sure. I mean, I think of it as, as really, it's kind of where development meets operations, right? Like, I feel like big picture, you know, in the beginning, there were engineers who wrote code and they owned it in production, right? right? And then everything got super complicated and we're like, ah, there's too much. So some of us are going to write code and some of us are going to understand it. And <laughs> that was not a bad idea. That was not a great idea. And so like, we're kind of like reunifying the streams now. I think every engineer should be writing their code and owning it in production. Everyone who's a specialist in operations should be also like, opening the door and looking under the hood and understanding the code, right? There's specialization is great, yeah. uh, but ultimately, you know, our systems have gotten so complex that yeah. you have to write it and understand I it. I feel like you got to dig into that own it in production because it's not like they're also going to be sysadmins. So exactly. As they are responsible for the... You're responsible for your systems, mm -hmm. right? You wrote it, you own it. You unleashed this horror upon the world. <laughs> like, I mean, I feel like there are these feedback loops at the heart of engineering. Sure. Some of them are like code review, right? Some of them are, are like deploys. But like, if you don't hook up the feedback loop, if you aren't being exposed to the consequence of what you're doing, then like, you're not, you don't actually know if your code is good or not. Well, I think there's, there's a great point there as a developer then that if my telemetry just tells me how many times my code was hit, that doesn't necessarily give me anything to do. And this is, this is where I feel like operations folks have had a harder time embracing observability in some ways than, than software engineers have, because with ops people, it's like, we learned how to debug, but it looked like this. I've got a dashboard, something's wrong, so I'm gonna start paging through dashboards and looking for similar spikes, just like pattern matching with my eyeballs, like, right. oh, it looks like it's Redis, you know? And you get the, it's, it's great, because you, like, you get this hero journey where you just jump to the end, right. and you <laughs> understand what's going on, because you're in this shit all day, every right. day. But nobody else does, they're like, whoa, how'd you do that? Yeah. Right. And all I did was reset the Redis service, <laughs> and problems went away. Right? But like, that's not debugging. Right. Pattern matching with your eyeballs is not debugging. Sure. Debugging looks like, you take a step, you ask a question, you look at the answer. Based on the answer, you take another step. It's like following a, bre a trail of breadcrumbs. You don't know what the answer looks like until you get there. Can we talk about some of the new modern uh, observability tools that we might think about using to replace the, the tools that we're currently using? Yeah, I mean, I think in big picture, um, it has to be based, it can't just be based on the metric because the right. number, you've discarded all that You're context. looking at the output. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. It has to be based on arbitrarily wide structured data blobs, which now look like spans, right? Those are just like wide events structured, mm. which you can trace because there's been a number that's appended to it. That's what you need in order to understand your telemetry in production. Because mm -hmm. I, can, I can imagine at a peak load, like we think about a metric that shows you know, this is when we're posting the most number of transactions. You're now really interested in the state of things. Like, yes. Where are we queuing up? Yes. You know? What's happening? Like, metrics are great, um, but they're, they're limited, right? right? They're a snapshot. What you want to be is like, you know, okay, when this happened, what else happened? Right. What else is connected to it? You know, and like the old generations of tools are ones where you've got, a, you're capturing this data a, another time for every single tool. Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, here's my dashboards, the metrics, here's my logs, here's my traces. So every time you're like, I've got a spike, I want to find it in the logs, there's nothing that connects them. Right. You're just eyeballing timestamps and hoping that they happen to match up. And like, if you're like, find it in the logs, you want to jump to a trace, like, that's right. not actually good enough. You can derive all of those data formats from these arbitrarily wide, from spans. You can't go in the other direction. When so, you say spans, what exactly are you talking about? A, a span is, a, is a one hop of a trace. Okay. Across all of them. So okay. should we be gathering spans all be, of the time? You should be time? gathering telemetry one event per request per service. It, all of the data should be aggregated into that one arbitrarily wide structured data blob so that you have all that context. Like a really mature instrumented uh, service will have like 200, 300 dimensions per 
per hop. Wow. And that's, that's magic because you're passing along all of the parameters, you're passing along all of the IDs, you're passing along all of that context, which, which lets you, after the fact, come back and say, oh, this thing in this service that happened was connected to that thing in that service that, that, that happened. Now, this is not necessarily a per transaction level. Like, you're not just chasing a transaction no. down. What's the... It's basically what separates one span response. from another? Mm. Is it um, time? It's, it's, well, typically, well, <laughs> this is a complicated yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are lots of ways um, that you can define a span, but typically I like to think it about, it, you want to have a span around something that's interesting. Right. Uh, so like if it's any time that you're crossing the network, you want a span. Right. Anytime you're taking a database request, you want to span because th that's historically where problems happen. It's <laughs> wherever you're crossing it. Right. So would you start at a user interface interaction and go from there, and then yeah. you know, likewise for backend services. That exactly. Go on timing, exactly. Timers. Like you can have you can have spans and tracing in Monoliths too, and it's super super useful there as sure. well. Um, but it becomes indispensable <laughs> once you when have services. Right. Yeah, because if you think about it, in the Monolith at least you have all that context mm. and it persists throughout the request. Mm. When you jump across the network from service to service, you're deciding what state's going to come with it. Exactly. So how do you do all this without bringing the server CPU to its knees? Do you do this typically the way we do it now? Is it attached to background threads and that kind of stuff? But yeah, you can I lose, mean, you know, if those threads hang, you can lose data. Uh, there are lots of ways to do it. Obviously, I think that my service does it best. <laughs> Your service. Honeycomb.io is what, it, what okay. I work on. So, well, you've got to tell us about Honeycomb. Then. Uh, well, sure. You know, I'm not, I'm not really great at pitching, but um, I will say that, like, you know, the idea of how observability should happen is how we built our service, you know, down okay. to like the data store, like, because, well, like rollback. How many of you, any of you ever build apps on Parse, the mobile backend as a service? Mm. Oh, no? No Parse people. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I love Parse so much. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was like Firebase, but better and earlier. Um, any Facebook people here? Okay, cool. I will have a Nobody grudge. Nobody uses Facebook? I will have a grudge against Mark Zuckerberg forever <laughs> for what he did to Parse. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. <laughs> they shut it down. It, like, I'm sorry. we got acquired. Anytime you want to get acquired, make sure that you have an executive level sponsor who believes in your product. Right. Um, we did not. Right. Mm. Um, so we got shut down, even though we were still growing like gangbusters. Anyway, Parse had a had 100 million apps by the time I left. Wow. And um, we had built our, our service originally on Ruby on Rails, which right. was not a terrible decision because most startups fail. It's usually not because of the technology no, that right. you choose. And Ruby on Rails had the strength of you could move fast. You could move fucking fast. Sorry. Is this a... We That's be. all right. We okay. believe everything. Yeah. Okay, great. Say whatever the Move fuck away. you want. It doesn't matter. Thank you. <laughs> Ruby on Rails. Uh, the downside is it's got... It doesn't have threads. Right. Fixed pool of workers, right? Yep. And so that was fine when we had 100,000 apps, but we got bigger and bigger. And instead of having one database in the back end, we now had 30, 40, 50. And when you've got that many, something's slow at any given time, yeah. mm -hmm. which means that the fixed pool is going, it's filling up constantly with threads that are waiting on that one back end service that's right. slow. Whatever grumpy mm -hmm. service you've got. Boom. And like as a reliability engineer, this was personally humiliating to me because mm. we were going down <laughs> every day, just like an app would hit the top 10 on iTunes. Down goes parse. <laughs> it's like <laughs> again and again. And um, I tried everything to, to try and figure this out. And what finally helped us was number one, we did a rewrite to Golang. Mm -hmm. We actually considered uh, using .NET and it got outvoted. And I learned later that the blog post that I wrote about why it got outvoted made a lot of people at Microsoft very angry and changed a lot of their decisions, which is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Inspiring anger is really my, my career. <laughs> But I mean, I can. Uh, I you made a career. I have a tough it. time of disagreeing with you on picking GoLang too. When you think yeah. about a backend service at velocity, yeah. it was like, great. That language is very well suited for that. Yeah, it was great, but it was half of the half of the answer. Right. Uh, because we also had to understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. Couldn't just write the code. We had to understand right. it. This is observability learned. It this is where observability came into play because Facebook also had this service called Scuba, which was don't get me wrong, but ugly. <laughs> a, aggressively hostile to users. 
But it did one thing really well, which is it would let you slice and dice in near real time on dimensions of high cardinality, these wide events, right? right. High cardinality, for those who don't know, is the number of unique items in a set. Right. So if you've got a collection of 100 million users, any unique ID, like social security number for the US folks, would be the highest possible cardinality. Something like species equals human would be the lowest because there's only <laughs> one. Right, first name, last name, high cardinality, but there's some dupes, so it's not as high as social security number. Mm. So everything around metrics is oriented around low cardinality dimensions. But mm. everything you want to use for debugging requires high cardinality sure. dimensions. I see some people over here who have run into these limits before. Um, so yeah. Scuba let us slice and dice on these high cardinality dimensions, and instead of having to like, you know, ops brain be like, either I, either I created a dashboard for it, or it's going to take me hours to like. Sift it dive out. through the logs right. and figure it out yeah. and everything. Uh, it's like instead it would be like, okay, we've, we're getting a spike in errors. Let's break down by app ID. One in ten million app IDs. Break down by that. Okay, now break down by error rates. Now break down by uh, by normalized database query. Now break are you down making by... cube um, uh, no, gestures like, or linear gestures? These are columns. <laughs> these are columns. Yeah, they're columns? <laughs> Breaking down okay. by column after column. I'm trying to interpret. For and the it listener. was just like step by step. It would take me to, it's, it's like, it isn't even engineering anymore. It's like yeah. support, right? Yeah. Uh, these problems went from being like intractable, like it would, mm. I'm doing that again, from like, it would take <laughs> us a day to figure out and then it would never happen again, uh, to just being like, you know, 30 seconds, yeah. like every single there. time. And that was what like, when I was leaving Facebook, you know, I've never been one of those kids who's like, I want to start a company because I kind of hate those people. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was thinking about having to live without this tooling, I was like, I, I can't, I actually can't conceive of it. Right, like right. it's become so core to how I, how I perceive the world as an engineer. Like mm. I, I just can't imagine going back. And so that's why we made Honeycomb. So when, how did the uh, rest of the people in the organization react to this new culture of observability and, uh, and spam you know what's based. amazing? Um, there's a learning curve, right? We've all spent our careers fitting our brain into asking questions in the metrics and dashboards mm. type of way. But like, you know how every job I've ever had, um, the person who's best at debugging is always the person who's been there the longest. Mm -hmm. Always. That's no longer true when you have different tools. Yeah. Because yeah. instead of relying so much on what's in your head mm -hmm. to reason about the system, it's right in front of you, and you're just asking questions, and it's, and it's more like the more curious you are, the more debugging you do, the, the better you get. You don't, have to, you don't have to have the whole system in your head. You can find the answer more quickly that way. Right. And it's kind of a beautiful thing. Yeah, the process of discovery too, right? Exactly. Find exceptions. That's why like, observability is not just about, yes, you're going to have to have columnar store. Yes, you're going to have to have all these things in the back end that make it fast. Because the other thing about logging tools is like, if you want to ask something interesting, it's like you enter the tool, you enter the, the and then you're like, okay, I'm going to take 30 minutes and go out for coffee because mm. it's going to like, it has to be fast. It has yeah. to be interactive. It has to be like under a second because you're like, mm -hmm. you're taking steps and you have to stay in the zone, yeah, right? You're, you're pursuing an intuition. It ha exactly. Mm -hmm. It has to be explorable. It has to be interactive. And it has to let you, I think most importantly, draw on the, on the brains of the people around you. So something we built into Honeycomb is, is, is history. You know how you're debugging and it's like, oh, I've lost the thread. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. need to I'm roll back. <laughs> <laughs> so you can just go that you scroll back up oh, that's where i knew i had it right and you branch off and you try something else but then also you have access to the history of, of everyone on your team mm -hmm. so if it's like last thanksgiving we had this terrible mysql outage you know and everything was shit uh and ben and emily were on call say and then i'm on call in march and i'm like this feels a lot like what was happening last last november yeah. i'm gonna go and look at like well, what were Ben and Emily doing? And what did they say helped them find the, what did they star? So also yeah. journaling. Yeah. The actions. Yeah. Because systems, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, yeah, right? Sure. And so much, <laughs> yeah. so much of the wisdom of your, like, these are socio-technical systems. It's not just production. Like an, an example I often use is, you've got the New York Times and the Washington Post. They're like both big newspapers, right? right. But if you took their teams and swapped them, you couldn't actually do that because so much of the socio-technical system lives in the heads mm -hmm. of the people the who use it are. and write it. Mm -hmm. So like being able to draw on that wisdom and use it, like it makes you a better engineer. Like 
all of the shit that I learned about being a great engineer was looking over the, over the shoulder of amazing engineers that I got to right. work with. But it sounds like the journaling approach you're talking about allows us to look over it's the best engineers that. all the time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, or, and get to, you, know, you don't have to remember how they did it because exactly. it's recorded there. Exactly. Indelibly. And yeah. so, you, you know, you can even learn their approach and how they tackled that. Particular I feel like, you know, especially now, nowadays when we're doing so much distributed working, like remote working, I worry a lot about how are we going to bring up the next generation of great yeah. engineers, yeah. you know? And I feel, I hope that we're all starting to think about baking this into more of our tooling. Just how can we learn from each other? You know, it's kind of embarrassing, but like when I was in college, I learned so much from just going around and reading the dot bash histories of all of the people I knew who knew their shit. Just up arrowing. <laughs> just like, <laughs> just like paging through this and like trying smart. the commands, you know? <laughs> What's like, that command? <laughs> it's fucking fascinating, yeah. right? Oh, that's how you try to learn set and knock, right? Yeah. I'm like, oh, what does this do? Like, I think we need a lot more of that in our tools. Yeah, and I, and I worry that we're making it even harder to make that jump from junior to an intermediate. I mean, we've always had a problem with intermediates anyway. Yeah. But a lot of the automation tools that are taking a lot of the, it's oh, God, I know. are eliminating the beginner oh. stuff. Yeah, like this, this whole like the generative AI stuff, mm -hmm. like it's great for senior engineers. You can, you're now so much more productive, you can code so much faster, but like the way that you get to that point is with scar tissue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How, how are we going to force ourselves? I mean, I believe that, that solutions will emerge I hope, yes. but it looks pretty bad. Well, right I, well, I also think that younger generation will find them too, because yeah, they so. are not. Yeah. You know, we we've done this show where we've talked about is all this scar tissue actually holding us back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. That we have uh, instincts. Some of it. Yeah. Much of it. Some of it's not all of it. I think you you know you have to internalize the damage and say yeah. like, what does this really look like? And generally speaking, when someone says, "I will never use X product or X technique," <laughs> it's like you have not internalized your scar as well. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Uh, every team has That's to have great. at least one senior citizen, I think. Yeah. 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 But also, that can they learn to speak to? These are the concerns I have. Yeah. When you think about the broader approaches to things that might have created that problem. I love that. Back in the past. You know, mm -hmm. I read this book called "The Trauma of Everyday Life," <laughs> which is written by this guy who's a psych psychiatrist and a Zen Buddhist, and he's talking about how. Um, Trauma isn't necessarily something to be avoided because it's literally what shapes you. Think about a bonsai tree. Sure. That's just a normal fucking tree, but it was, yep. it was put in this very specific where its roots couldn't grow, right? Yep. And so it's not, it's like not a recipe for like, trauma is great, but it's also like their scar tissue is just going to be different. Yeah. And, and again, how you react to it and how you work to it, you can make beautiful things from that. So exactly. what are some of the other pitfalls that people will encounter when sort of moving to this observability uh, methodology? You know, a big one is the cognitive, just the, the model that we have in our brain. Um, I, I feel like our industry has uh, avoided this for a, a long time, and mm. I feel like there's a bit of a reckoning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, open telemetry, by the way, is, i got to put in a quick plug for open telemetry Absolutely. here. It's amazing. Uh, I know all of us hate redoing our, our code, but like the, the promise of open telemetry is you reinstrument your code once, and then vendors have to compete for your dollars based on being awesome instead of having you locked in. Mm, right. It is, it's, it's the number two um, project after Kubernetes um, in the, whatchamacallit? Yeah, CNCF. Yeah. Thank you, CNCF. It's super active, a lot of contributors. I was pretty skeptical about this, but it, it's 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 the way. I wish we had had this ten years ago. I think we'd all be in a better place. And the crazy part is, you know, we could have. We could have. We just chose. We could have. Do. This yeah. is a political problem, not a technical totally, problem. Totally, but we're there now. But here we are. These are the tools that we have. Open telemetry is worth putting on your roadmap for the next year or two because there is also this this reckoning that's happening with costs right now. Mm -hmm. Most of these vendors are billing just like ungodly amounts of dollars that do not correspond to the value that you get out right. of them because they can't because they've got you stuck. locked yeah yeah and so i feel like we need to take our power well, back and it's a great pitch for a feature that's not necessarily a new feature it's to say hey i can reduce our yes. cost by moving us off this yes. tool yes. and onto open telemetry you know i 
I'm going on so many sidebar rants here, but like I feel like learning to train, like one artifact of the zero interest rate like period was that engineers forgot how to talk about our work in terms of dollars. ROI, yeah. You know, because like dollars are the universal denominator. Maybe someday it'll be euros. I don't know, but like money is the universal denominator. And if we can't learn to talk about the value of the shit that we provide to people in finance, people. I feel like many, VP, many VPs of engineering and CTOs have this phenomenon where they feel like the junior partner at the table. Right. They aren't really invited to all of the critical meetings and stuff. And I believe that that's because we haven't learned to talk about the value that we bring and cost in the same language as every other team has. Because if we did, we generate a lot of value. Oh, we generate all the fucking value. Every company is a technology company. We have all the power we should need to have. All we gotta do is take a, take, get a hand on it. <laughs> And Charity, I'm going to interrupt for one moment for this very important message. <laughs> and we're back. It's .NET Rocks. I'm Richard Campbell. That's Carl Franklin. Hey. Talking to our friend Charity Majors about observability engineering and watching the sausage being made. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I want to follow up on you, you brought up generative AI and things. For programmers, it's great. For senior programmers who can be more productive with stuff they might have forgotten how to write or don't really care to figure out and just let chat GPT do it for you. But um, what do you think the future of observability is, especially in lieu of AI and where it's going? Do you think that we'll have AI bots sort of watching our telemetry and giving us English prompts, you know, sending us text messages? I think that vendors are going to sell CTOs and VPs like tens of millions of dollars worth of bullshit that says that they can do that. Yeah. Yes. Something that blew my mind when I became a CTO. So wait a minute, are you, so are you saying we don't need this. We all, we have everything that we need. No, right I'm not there saying that us, either. So. Something that blew my mind when I came to CTO. It took me a while to internalize. But the the most executives have more trust and confidence in their vendor relationships yeah. than their yeah. employees yeah. because yeah. employees come and go, but vendors last forever. As long as you keep paying them. Blew my fucking mind. Yeah. Um. The the. But what they're selling when they come in, this is why my, my dander got raised so much by the whole AI ops thing. Because they were all just like, you don't need to understand your systems. Pay us all this money. We'll understand it for you. And the, like the false positives are ridiculous and off the charts. Yep. All of the data is junk. You would be better off just like turning off all that data. Like it just so many problems with it. I believe that we should be looking to computers to do what computers do best mm -hmm. and people to do what people do best. And computers crunch numbers. Yeah. People attach meaning to things. Sure. Like your graphs are spiking all day long. Most of them you don't care about because our computers are now resilient to a whole lot of failures. Sure. It really takes a person coming along and going, That's that a bad matters. One. Yeah. That matters often because it mattered to another person. And you're the person who's there connecting those dots. And once you've decided it matters, you need to understand why. Yeah. And I think there are all kinds of ways for computers to help us do that. We do this really cool thing called bubble up at Honeycomb, where any graph, that, any heat map that you've constructed, you draw a little bubble around something. You're like, I care about this. And then we compute the baseline for all the hundreds of dimensions and the dimensions that are inside the thing you care about, and then we diff them and sort them. Right. So it's like, okay, this thing you care about, here are the five to 10 ways that is different from everything that you don't care about. Computers are great at that, right. but they can't tell you what to care about, and they shouldn't try because it's a fucking mess. Maybe 10 years from now, I will be eating my words, but for the foreseeable future, I really think that we're all best served if we focus on helping people understand what has meaning mm. and letting computers take care of the rest. Yeah, yeah I mean, I can smart. see the machine tools helping to point us to unusual effects. Oh, yeah. Mm. But you still have to interpret them. Yeah. Yeah. And, you still and, you want them to create that graph for you. You want them to intelligently sample mm -hmm. often. Mm -hmm. You want them to do you know, but you don't want them in the business of telling you what matters. No, they, right. they, they don't know. They don't know. And more and more saliently, like they're not even qualified to to make that assessment in any in any way. That being said, like I gotta tell you, we're talking a lot of OLAP terms here, like a lot of data analytic terms around all of this. And machine learning models evolved from yeah. a lot of that technology. So you can see a shape of uh, the shape of history. You here. can see a shape, uh, but I, I don't believe that it is, it is one that I, so here's the thing at the bottom line, we are forget technology. We are held legally accountable. We sure. are engineers. We are legally and ethically and morally accountable for the code that we put out into the world. Right. We can't, 
point of an algorithm when it comes to that, even if it's a machine learning. I think we I have. I don't know if you've read it, Eula, lately, but boy, oh boy, they work really hard to make sure we're not legally accountable for anything. I believe in the near infinite possibility of lawyers. That's that's true. Well, but I I want to make sure that I understand what I put out into the world. I also, I mean, I like that it, it, we're also talking a moral and ethical aspect because I think we need, I think that legal aspect's holding us back. Mm. That we can't own the value of what we make. Say more about that. That we can't own the value of a make as long as we're obligating our, our responsibilities to owning it. Right, that really, you know, the EULA was invented to allow us to not hold liability for the impact of our software. Interesting. And so we're kind of in a trap, right, as an industry. If we were responsible for the damage we did, we would, we would, our employers would insist on higher standards yeah. because they're getting caught up in that as well. But because we've avoided that responsibility so thoroughly. Mm. I see what you're saying. Um... I mean, that being said, like this is now we get into a pretty deep philosophical side yeah. on this thing. Like, let's face it, good telemetry. In the end, we're trying to understand why is the software behaving the way it's behaving. Yeah. Why are our customers unhappy? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are the things that actually matter. I think the more often that we as technologists speak in the term of the customer, I think you're why right. are our customers unhappy? You know, and this is something I've been really grappling with lately. I don't know if I'm alone in this or not, but I have like an almost knee jerk, almost dis gust or, or like reaction to words like customer and value and things and i've been trying to like because we've been battered with it because we were what <laughs> we've been battered we're with beaten it. up yeah. with those words yeah like, i don't know I, just the business aspect like I, I think there's some vestiges of me that are still like ew we're better than that and i and i hate myself as i'm saying that you know and it's because you also I, open with the dollars matter they do and they do kind of come from the customer oh you should have seen me 10 years ago dude <laughs> <laughs> chill version. I get that. Okay. <laughs> no, but you're, you're absolutely right. We do this for the customer. We do this for our users. Mm -hmm. That's the reason that we exist, and we have a responsibility to them. Sure. And I don't think I'll ever feel comfortable saying, well, the machine told me it was fine. That's a cop-out every time, because yeah. the machine didn't tell you anything. You interpreted it and chose to vocalize ah, it. You know, in the end, everything we've talked about we Never, programmed it to tell not, us it was fine. We're getting very <laughs> philosophical. But also, none of this described an action we should take. Yeah. All we're doing mm. is observing what's going on. We still have to decide on the action. How would you change the code given you've seen this in telemetry? And you know what else? Like, I feel like this loops back really nicely into just like, what is what is the meaningful life, right? Like, <laughs> because like that, that book that What's His Face wrote about, about work and what makes us happy is, is it's not like, having 20 hours a day, whatever, but it's like autonomy, mastery, Three. and Pur meaning. Purpose, yeah. And yeah. Purpose. Dan Daniel Pink. And Daniel Pink, thank you. And like the meaning, the purpose, that comes into play for us when it impacts other people. Well, and you hit on the key thing, which is when we crack this nut, like every time you chase a problem down like that and it turns into a code change you can make that then in later testing shows that problem has occurred, Boy, that's a good day. That like, feels so good. You talk about purpose? Yeah. There is nothing better than nothing figuring better than that, that complicated problem out. And then literally, like you you, you live in a very hyp uh, hypothesis-based world. It's like, well, I've seen this telemetry. I've seen this output. Yeah. I believe it's this code problem. Yeah. Now I'm going to make a modification. I'm going to put it into the stream. And I'm going to go back and test again. Yep. And if I don't see it, then I can you know, hypothesize, really, because I might be wrong. We may not have recreated conditions perfectly that we're on it, that we're yeah. pushing the right thing. And nobody knows just how deep that went but you. No. I also wonder, you know, how many times have you been fighting a problem like that and you start changing code just to see if you can change behavior <laughs> at all? Like, am I even poking in the right place? Like our systems are, they have a merge of properties. They're yeah. no longer, like, I feel like part of moving from, like, um, the old world to the new is accepting that TDD is not enough. Mm, interesting. It, like tests tell you, will this logically execute? Yeah. But that reality ends at the border of your laptop. Yes. The, right? the universe is weirder. The than that. universe is so much weirder than that. I feel like our jobs are not done. It like until we've instrumented that code, deployed it, and watched it in production, and asked ourselves, is it doing what I expected yes. it to do? And does anything else look weird? I, I like, know that's job, something I've said. On the show before, I was, you know, I've been a lot of load testing. It's like I have never invented load tests as weird as customers nope. on a Saturday. That's where entropy <laughs> like, comes from. <laughs> you can't even come close. 
So customers are evil. They yeah. do things you can't They're imagine. Brilliant. Did that guy really open six windows and hit refresh all at the same time? Did he really? Really? Okay. Okay, uh, let me ask you some practical advice on behalf of the listeners. So let's say you're listening, you're, you've been surfing, you went to uh, um, honeycomb.io and you checked it out and you're thinking this might be good. How do you go back to your, how do these people in the audience go back to their teams and introduce this concept without getting flogged? You know, how, how do you approach that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, my approach is always to look for something that's really painful. Like, um, you know, things that are going down that you don't understand. Probably can't crack. Problem you can't crack. And things, especially this, this siloed approach to telemetry that we're that doing getting, now. Things that are waking people up in the middle of the night. Yeah. You know, we've seen this a lot where, you know, people have tried to bring it in, whatever, but then there's an intractable problem and they put honeycomb on it and it's just like, like we've even had multiple times we've had our sales engineers doing demos on people's production systems it's and go, ah, you're, ha you're about to have an outage here because this thing's happened and they're like, what the, and then like 10 minutes later they get Dunk. paged. Because it, it, is, it is that, like, I know I'm a founder, believe nothing I say, but it's that much easier when you have the right tools. When you have the right visibility, yeah. you know, just to be able to see what's going on. Yeah, looking for something like that or somewhat counterintuitively, um, the other side, uh, another place we've seen a lot of success is people instrumenting their CICD pipelines. Right. Because if you instrument your CICD pipeline as a trace, you can see where all that time is going. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of another uh, uh, approach to just the model of what is the hard work here? Yeah. Like what, what's actually hurting us? The struggle is only getting in the front door. We have like zero churn. If the company didn't go out of business, they keep buying us. Uh, but it's difficult yeah. to get in the front door. But once we get inside, like right. people use no, I, but I think you've made the most compelling argument, and that's mm -hmm. going to be tough for anyone in the room who's thinking about this. It's like you have to go pick the largest dragon in the room and, and say, it. "I think I could take that one on yeah. if I had this lance." Yeah. yeah. Like, if I can get this lance and get it go, I'll go for the big guy. Yeah. And and that's the the kind of bet you need to make. But you know the underlying part of this because a lot of the software is already set up for the right telemetry, but it's the custom stuff we're building that's not. Yeah. And how you provide good visibility into that. Yep, orienting it around. You know, a lot of people also come to us when they start their open telemetry journey because we yeah. have many of the world's best experts in OTEL. So we could actually help consult as people what, are rolling that what out. What do I need to push onto the open tele telemetry stack that's going to help me, that's going to let these tools exactly. understand what my app's doing? Exactly. Do any of you in the room have a question for Charity? Raise your hand. Or just speak up. No questions. All right, right here. Phil Hack has a question. So, how do you all manage the data that's created? That must be an intense amount of data. And then oh, yeah. People want history for a mm -hmm. long time. And, and, like, does that cost get, like, out of hand? Because it's something very rigorous. So, Why don't you repeat the question? Uh, the, the question is that's a lot of data. And how does that cost, how, how does the cost get out? Does the cost not get out of hand? Um, this is why, so on Twitter, I was joking the other week and it kind of got out of control. I'm like, never write a database. No, really, never write a database. <laughs> and I thought it was a very fun self-own because we wrote a database. People didn't understand that. Um, so yeah, it's a fuckload of data. Like we've got like 700 customers and we run the combined production loads of all of them. It's like 2 billion events per second or something like that. Um, uh, and we give everyone 60 days of storage, um, basically for free. Um, and the way that we do this, um, we, um, so it's a columnar store. So indexes are verboten for observability because indexes are a way of picking, I want this to run fast and nothing else to run fast. You want to be able to query on any of these dimensions. So it's a columnar store. Um, and you're right, like two years in, we ran into this, fuck, we're never going to be profitable because there's so, all these SSDs, all this RAM. Uh, and that's when one of my, this guy, Brilliant engineer, I've been working, he was my first manager, his name is Ian, he's, he's nowhere on the internet, he's amazing. Uh, he started looking into the, the cost models and, and did some tests, and so now actually, so we, data comes in, hits the API, gets dropped into Kafka, uh, then gets read off um, onto you know, a pair of nodes, um, which are, as you would think, like lots of CPU, lots of RAM, but then after like 30 to 60 minutes, it gets tailed out to, um, to S3. Uh, the query planner actually runs via Lambda jobs. Uh, so the query planner comes in, forks out, spans, um, and, and like 
we thought it was going to be so much slower, like doing processing, you know, from all these S3 buckets. It wasn't. It was different performance characteristics, but most queries still return with under a second. Um, and S3 is dead cheap. So that's where most of the data is. And the Lambda jobs are pretty expensive. That's a big line item in our, on our bills. So we've done, we've actually done some really great talks and, and written some great pieces about how we use Honeycomb to optimize our Lambda jobs so that the query can enter. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's not recursive at all. Yeah. yeah. Our Honeycomb blog, by the way, is dope. Like, we, we don't do a lot of selling there. We just talk about a lot of engineering shit, and it's pretty great. There was another question back here first. Somebody back there had a, their hand up? Uh, okay, it wasn't you, but <laughs> go ahead. ahead. Uh, to, it's usually too expensive to uh, uh, aggregate and store all the traces. So what is the balance? So of... there's a... Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. So the question, I think, was um, something, there was something about um, SLOs and metrics, and it's too expensive to store all the traces for all the events. OK. Um, and there's a few di different answers for this. I would probably want to ask you some more questions. Feel free to find me afterwards. Um, but you're absolutely right. It can be absolutely cost prohibitive to store a trace for every, if you have high, a lot of traffic, because if you think about it, you might find yourself storing five to 30 times as much telemetry data as production traffic. Obviously, that's not tenable, right? Um, the first solution that we usually steer people towards is um, uh, intelligent sampling, which does not mean just like dumb, dumb sampling where you're like one out of every 10, you drop them. It means like uh, we have a thing called refinery where you, there's a difference between head, 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 head sampling and tail sampling, meaning sampling before you know what it is coming and after you know what it's coming. So some of these things you sample after you know what's coming so you can be sure and grab all of the slow events, right? Some of it is head sampling where you're just like, okay, um, uh, for example, request their health checks that are 200s. This is junk. I don't need to store all of these. Yeah, this can be like a quarter of your traffic sometimes. So like sample them heavily. 200 OKs to the main page, sample them medium. Uh, keep every request that's an error or every request that is to slash payments or to billing or, you know, like there's a lot of shit that is trash that you can like <laughs> discard uh, if you kind of go in there with a fine tooth comb. Um, the part that was about, um, about SLOs, um, we derive SLOs from events, and it's actually really important that they're not derived from um, metrics. Um, we are actually the only product out there that does SLOs the way they're supposed to be done per the Google SRE book, um, because other companies don't actually capture their data in a way that lets them do that. <laughs> mm. It's actually pretty dope. Like you, you have your SLOs, it tells you how, how quickly you're burning down the budget, uh, and then it tells you what what is different about the requests that are erroring, that are burning down the budget versus the others, so you can go and fix them, blah, blah, blah. Um, we also have a metrics, this is why I'm not sure if you're talking about our metrics product or um, just the events, but like the number one answer to the events being too expensive is you use um, smart sampling. And the number one answer to the SLOs is you want those badly. We You can absolutely do sampling. So one of the one of the things in every event that gets sent to us, there is a sample rate embedded in it. So everyone will say like one slash five, and that means compute this to be five like this. Uh, so the numbers all all work out to look like they weren't sampled. Mm. We got Does a that question. Make sense? Okay. We got to move on. Question right in the front. Hello. to 
pretty much. Hang on, can you repeat that with the mic? Yes, yeah. sorry. <laughs> what is a top thing to avoid when you're doing observability? So we started our system, you know, it would be logging. Uh, there is a thing as too much logging. You get lost in those logs. They're yeah. also expensive. Then we went to metrics. Again, yeah. there is a thing that is too much metrics and it's expensive. We yeah. use AWS. Obviously, you can go wrong with observability as well. So what are those things to avoid? I think partially you already answered the question a bit. Yeah. But is there something else that you would like to say? What is that thing that we would like to avoid when doing observability? That's a great can you question. The question, again? Uh, the question was, obviously, you can go wrong with logging because you can get way too many log events. You can go wrong with metrics because you could, you could have famously like the $30,000 metric that had high cardinality in it and oops, your budget. Um, and so the question is, I think, how can you go wrong with observability? Um, as distinct from those, you know, and I want to say, even if you aren't doing traces, even if, the most important thing to take away when it comes to telemetry is the magic of the one wide structured event per request per service. I actually found out years into this that this is how Amazon has done their telemetry all along. They have like a flat file at the root domain of every node where they keep one of these like wide, it's, it's magic, it makes everything, because a lot of the logs that you um, are encountering are because like when a request is executing through, an, through a, um, a service, it's just like, boom, all, this, all these strings, right? Mm. But if you just like collapse them into one wide event with all of those keys and values, mm. um, then you have that, that context, right? You can right. correlate all them, together. it's magic. Yeah. Uh, so the number one thing that I think people get wrong with observability is not understanding that. That's the heart of everything. It isn't which tool you're using. It isn't whether you're tracing or not. It's that it's that. It's that that is the, the, the number one thing that everyone should be caring about. Uh, the number two thing I think comes out when dealing with spans, slightly order higher order problem. Um, and that's because I feel like as an industry, we haven't really, we aren't really, we don't really have a set of like good conventions. You were asking me like, when should you have a span? Man, like I hope five years from now, everybody's like, well, obviously you should have a span when blah, 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 but we aren't there yet, right? And so it's really easy to either generate too many spans uh, and then get lost in the noise, kind of like with logs, or too few spans and then not have the detail that you need when you need it. Right in front. Hold on, here comes the microphone. Very good. If you can go to a team and say, okay, we're going to, we're going to introduce open telemetry. What would you say is the best thing to start as a first target? I know that's an open question, but where would you aim to go for first? The question is where to start um, with open telemetry. And there are only two good answers. One is my favorite uh, with the biggest pain. Um, and if you, but you have a really like fear, like <laughs> if you have a really resistant culture, then start with the least pain. Uh, but I actually think that the best way to roll anything that has to do with telemetry out is to, is to kind of think of your attention like a headlamp. And if you're on call for something that's breaking, have an instrument's first mentality. Like you instrument to figure out what's wrong, not you fuck around with your graph to find. Instrument, have it tell you the answer, and then it's there for the next time. You get paged again, you instrument, you find the problem, and it's there. And, and as your headlamp kind of moves around the stack, um, you know, within a couple of months, most of the stuff that really matters will be instrumented, and then you can put it on the backlog to do the rest and finish up and get rid of your old vendors. All right. Well, I think that's it. So let's give uh, Charity Majors a big round of applause. And we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks!